I did want to um, take some time to um, introduce our dean, uh, Jason Pierce. Um, and I'm going to embarrass him um, before he comes up and, and, and share some remarks with you. So Jason came to the Department of Political Science um, how many years ago this was? It seems a long time ago. And um, then became our chair. And he's now dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, which is the largest entity. Um, but the really important thing, and this is why I'm delighted that he agreed to, to share some remarks with you today, is that in, in 2011, the, the, um, Paul Benson, who was dean at the time and had addressed this meeting two years ago, uh, created a strategic planning committee to think about creating a human rights center. As you've heard many times now, we had a human rights concentration in international studies back in 98. We got the BA in human rights in 2007. We would had many conferences in between. So the next logical thing was to think about a human rights center with the vision we have now. And so Dr. Curran, president who spoke to you yesterday, had, had made this decision, the provost. And wisely, they turned to Jason to chair the committee to put this thing together. And I think we started in January. And we submitted our report in July 11. Now, there was a lot of work still to do, but it was an incredible process. You remember that? I would get like emails from him like 5.30 in the morning. We got to change paragraph two. Um, but it was a wonderful process, and he shepherded us through it. And then there was much more to do after that. But that set the foundation. That convinced the university um, of the viability of this. And, and, and that really set us on this road. So um, as we are at the second social practice of human rights, having moved in to actually the center, um, I, I wanted to invite Jason to, to share some remarks. But also, I wanted to take this opportunity to thank you for, for the work you did. So the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, Jason Pierce. Well, good afternoon. I know you've uh, had a full day of, of discussion and certainly a lot of listening to, to other people speak. And so I really will keep my remarks very brief so that you can get back to those fruitful conversations taking place uh, around the table. Uh, Mark, I appreciate those, uh, those uh, kind words and introduction. Uh, I do feel I need to also uh, extend my thanks uh, to all of you, the presenters, the plenary speakers, those of you who ventured uh, to Dayton, Ohio from far and wide. We're really glad that you're here. I also want to pass on my thanks uh, to all of the individuals who helped put this conference together. And let me list them real quickly uh, and ask you actually to look in the back of the program and you'll see their names. Uh, but uh, Christy Belton, Joel Pruce, uh, Mark and Salako, Yusuf Farhat, and certainly Monty uh, Moyer, and all of the event staff, would you join me in thanking all these people? Thank you. <laughs> really do appreciate all of the great work. So I was in uh, the Dayton Airport uh, the other day looking at, uh, had a few minutes to spare, and I was looking at uh, the books and magazines uh, that one could purchase. And I noticed that there's this new word that seems to be all of the buzz popping up on magazine covers and book covers, and the word is disruptive. Have you heard this in the vernacular of late? Uh, the titles talked about disruptive innovation disruptive technology, disruptive leadership, right? And it had often pictures of Steve Jobs or a photo of the iPhone or whoever the founder of Uber was, right? Disruptive seems to be, I think, in our, uh, in our vocabulary today. What I'd like to do is I'd like to just say a few things about this idea of, of a disruptive place. And uh, just to signal uh, where we're going, I'm, I'm going to suggest that uh, this conference is a rather disruptive place. And that's a good thing. Uh, let me begin, though, by, by pointing out, I feel I need to do a little bit, a little bit of uh, Chamber of Commerce work uh, here, since you're here in Dayton, Ohio. And let me begin by just reminding you that those of us who call uh, Dayton, Ohio home uh, like to think about 
Dayton, Ohio as a disruptive place. If you go back 100 years ago, uh, these two brothers, Wilbur and Orville Wright, uh, invented the plane here, right? A disruptive act. This building that you're in, uh, the previous owner was National Cash Register, NCR. And there was a team of several hundred engineers that in the 1940s were responsible for constructing the Enigma code-breaking machine. Not in this building, but just uh, you know, two-tenths of a mile that way in what was called Building 26. The Enigma code-breaking machine was developed here in Dayton, Ohio, a disruptive event. We're celebrating this November uh, the 20th anniversary of the signing of the Dayton Peace Accords. And uh, we'll have all sorts of important players from that moment in history coming back to Dayton to celebrate that. And we look forward to that very, very much. Another disrupting event coming from Dayton, Ohio. We also like to think about the University of Dayton as a disruptive place. If you look at our uh, founding order, the Marianists, they do take a vow of stability. But having said that, uh, they also, when they have, uh, when they talk about their educational philosophy, they talk about reading the signs of the times and equipping students for adaptation and change. And I think if there's one animating spirit, you see the University of Dayton responding to that Marianist call for adaptation and change. Also here in this building, the University of Dayton Research Institute manages about $100 million of sponsored research every year, disruptive research or innovative research that explores energy, fuel usage, sensors, propulsion, and materials. We have students in uh, a School of Engineering program called the Ethos program, where every summer we send students from the university to about 20 different countries uh, across the globe to work with local communities uh, to conduct different engineering projects on the ground. Uh, for those of you who heard from our students last night from Malawi, we've had Ethos students there. And I think you'll, looking at our ethos program, uh, you see that sort of innovation that I think animates the university. And certainly, the Human Rights Center and this conference and the way that I think Mark and Joel and Christy and many, many others have sort of structured this, this conference is intentionally envisioned uh, as a disrupting conference, a time where we can hold up those assumptions and really interrogate them and to look for new ways, new pathways forward. Uh, another quick uh, note about Dayton to do my Chamber of Commerce duty, uh, and I hope that there are some folks who are uh, still familiar with the TV show, The West Wing, anyone? I, I, I raise this question to my students. I might as well be talking about, you know, the uh, silent films uh, from decades ago. But for those of you who would remember the West Wing, we have a really great Dayton connection to the West Wing. Rob Lowe is a Daytonian. Anna Allison Jenning is a Daytonian. And President Bartlett, AKA Martin Sheen, is also a Daytonian. Last May, in fact, uh, we had the great privilege of welcoming Martin Sheen, or as he is known locally, Ramon Estevez, uh, back to the University of Dayton to receive an honorary degree. Uh, Martin Sheen actually lived just a few blocks from this building. Uh, he attended a, a Marianist high school, a Catholic high school here in the Dayton area. And there was nothing that his father desired more than for Martin to go to the University of Dayton. Back then, we had a university entrance exam, and Martin Sheen purposefully failed it. 
Apparently, it, out of 100 points, uh, Mr. Sheen earned three, which the registrar has logged as the lowest score ever. And instead, he wanted to go to New York City to do this acting thing, right? Well, he went and obviously did a, a, tremendous, uh, a tremendous job. Well, he gave a stirring acceptance speech uh, at our graduation ceremony last May. It was terrific. You can, look, you can listen to it online. Uh, there's a, a YouTube video. He quoted from many people that this group would be familiar with. One of the lines that was his line, though, is the line that I want to share with you. And he said this at one point. Uh, Mr. Sheen said, acting is what I do for a living, and activism is what I do to stay alive. Now, you have probably noticed here even today how we have had students at this conference from start to finish. We've had student presenters. We've had students who have put together that art display out front. And obviously, we've had many students uh, here in our audiences. And so I'm not a, a human rights scholar myself, uh, but I am an educator. And so if I could share just a couple quick observations as an educator, uh, what I would just convey to you is that the students who have heard your presentations, who have heard your plenary sessions, they really sense your energy and your enthusiasm and your commitment. And as I was thinking about this conference and the way that the students have participated and the way that you have welcomed the students uh, in your midst, uh, I really think that the students also sense the disruptive potential that human rights research and human rights advocacy bring to the human condition. This field of study is something that really excites them, that encourages them uh, to find some way to take what they're studying here at UD and make a difference. So as an educator, I spend a lot of time thinking about how we can best prepare our students for whatever might come after graduation. And so beyond the research, beyond the discussions, let me say thank you in two different ways to you. Uh, first, I do want to thank you for demonstrating to all of our students the many shades and the many shapes of activism the activism that you've done, the activism that Martin Sheen talks about. And secondly, I also want to thank you for going actually one step further, one step further than Martin Sheen. If acting is what he does for a living and activism is what he does to stay alive, I think you have also demonstrated to our students by your presence and by your contributions here, that it is also possible that what you do for a living can also be what you do to stay alive. In UD's parlance, the word that we would use to describe that is vocation. We talk about matching our students' gifts and talents with the world's needs. And I think by having our students here, by having you here, you have helped to put some path, some, uh, some stepping stones with our students as they're thinking about their own vocational path. And as our students are thinking about their vocational path, that's very exciting as an educator for what it will bring uh, to them as aspiring human rights advocates. And so as an educator, I just wanted to thank you, uh, all of the participants, for, for that gift that you've given to our students. That's all I wanted to share with you. I do wish you a, a, a successful conclusion to the afternoon's uh, session. And thank you again for coming to the University of Dayton and this conference. All the best. <laughs>